I'd be happy to call the meeting to order and so do. And the first item of business is the election of a new chairman or chair, chair. And so Don resigned. Don has moved to Waitley. I not moved to Amherst. It's good news for Don. Remarried, so very exciting. So for oh, us, are there nominations? Are there nominations? Okay. I would like to nominate Grant. Second you. I think he's done a lot of the work of the chair over the last year and a half, at least, if not more. I would accept the nomination. Are there any other nominations? I mean, Judy, I've nominated you privately by email, but you've indicated, well, I'll do it formally. I would nominate you. I, I do not accept. We got that out of the way. But I, I'm pleased at the, at the, that you did that. You weren't well, the only one who reached out. So no, thank you all. So, I wouldn't even uh, consider taking the nomination if it weren't for the fact that I think you guys are all great and we've worked together so well as a team and I'd love to see that continue. So if I can take this on and rely on all of you to keep me in the straight and narrow and not screw things up, then, then I'm we'll good. Yeah, that's right. I, think we, I know. I think we, I know have, it's a we should have a vote first, however, before you. Yes, I'm not. This is just a, a just sort of a <laughs> thank you for the nomination. Mary, we've just we've called the meeting to order and we have nominated. I nominated Grant to be the new chair and Tom seconded. And I'm about to call for a vote. All and for the record, Grant nominated Judy and she declined. I mean, okay. it's sort of like we're <laughs> trying to stick each other with this job. <laughs> Thank you. Please proceed. So, all in favor of Grant as chair? I, and I guess I should I, abstain. I, I, well, you're outvoted anyway. So, <laughs> congratulations, Grant. All right. You have our Good. sympathies. No backs. Thanks. Thanks. All right. All right, so the motion passed, and I guess then, Judy, I'll immediately- Now you now come. are in charge. Okay, right. off the awesome power. I'll have to follow with Don to get the keys to the planning board helicopter and uh, the name of our current driver. But um, aside from that, we should <laughs> proceed. Yeah. All right, well. Um, so that was great. Thank you. We'll move ahead with our agenda. The next item of business tonight is a discussion of the potential acquisition of the T guys property at 110 Christian Lane by Klondike Sound of Greenfield. And Jason Raboyne is here and I see Jason on camera. Now I get to see you. I've only had phone calls with you. So welcome. Thank you. So um, Jason has submitted an application for a site plan review. Uh, he's preparing to acquire and uh, move into the T-Guys facility on, in Christian Lane. Uh, and the question before, this is a, really a discussion of should there be a, do we need a site plan review? I mean, he submitted the application, he's, he's left the check. But I think what we'd like to do, Jason, is we've got your materials, they're publicly posted on tonight's meeting site, your letter. Um, but what I'd like to do is have you, in your own words, tell us a little bit about, um, how about a little bit about the company? Uh, you've been in Greenfield for a while, just give us a little bit about you know, you and your company, your plans to, you know, move to Waitley and your plans for that property. How about that? Let's start with that. Okay. Uh, Klondike Sound started in Wendell almost 50 years ago. Uh, 
founder uh, moved it to Greenfield. I'm not even sure it was there been in the same building for quite a while in the industrial park. Um, I purchased the company in 2016 uh, after uh, touring, basically I was a touring sound engineer for almost 20 years. I spent uh, the last 15 of those touring with Joan Baez. So sort of saw the world with her. And uh, as she was ending her career, I, I was looking for something else to do. I didn't want to tour anymore. So uh, I bought Klondike and using uh, connections I made, we've, we've grown quite a bit. We've gone from just doing sound to doing sound and lighting and staging. And um, basically, if you hear live music, they had to buy a ticket to in the Valley. I generally had something to do with it. Um, so our building currently is 4,000 square feet with some loft space. And uh, we're just sort of packed to the gills. I'm not trying to expand any more than we already have, but we need to increase the efficiency with which we um, service our clients. And uh, the Tea Guys property is kind of perfect, actually. Um, my employees are happy that I'm not buying something bigger because I would fill it with other stuff that they have to take care of. So it sort of keeps me contained, um, but allows us to efficiently do what we do. Um, and, you know, that's everything we spent last week at Smith doing the presidential inauguration. And uh, now we're pretty quiet and start fixing things and cleaning things. Um, but from uh, April through October, we do, you know, Green River Festival, Newport Folk and Newport Jazz and uh, specialize in folk and jazz and Americana music. Um, and, uh, you know, Smith and Amherst are my biggest clients. And where does the acquisition stand at this point? Uh, we have a signed purchase and sale. I have a uh, mortgage in place ready to go. We're waiting on an appraisal to come back, but don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, a couple little uh, things that we're going back and forth on. Um, so uh, not to get too far into the weeds too quickly, but it was the, the building was marketed as having an apartment and there's a tenant in the apartment. All of my re research shows that it's not zoned for that. Uh, and it doesn't have a second egress. And there are all sorts of things that came up in, in uh, due diligence that uh, I'm asking for proof that it's actually a legally rentable space. And if it's not, which is what I think it is, there might be a bit of a renegotiation for that. Um, but uh, the the building was foreclosed on and we stopped an auction. And if we don't get this done, it's going to be go up to auction. So, you know, he has no choice but to sell. Uh, he's auctioning off all of his equipment and the company is is done, uh, basically. So um, we're looking to close sometime between November 18th and December 1st. Great. And could you, you know how just... many changes you're making to the exterior is the loading dock? That's my understanding. Yeah, at this point, that's all I, I was hoping to do. And can you, you say it goes at the rear, does it go directly behind the existing so, building? Is anything there now? Is something coming off? So the building, the building is actually built in four parts. There's a 19th century train station. Um, and then there is a 150 by 50, um, I guess it's technically called a pole barn, but warehouse. Um, that was built in two parts. And then past that is a 30 by 32 building. So there's an, there's an L at the back that's 20 feet by 32 feet. If you can imagine that sticking a 30 foot wide building on the back of a 50 foot building, uh, it creates an L. And that's the space that we're talking about now. It's currently a loading area. Um, it's, it's paid. It's just that they, they built the whole, uh, space up so that a truck would uh it's not a normal loading area you know it's it's you could drive in the door it's at the yeah and and i just need to remove what they built up so that it's a normal loading dock where the the back of the truck the loading part of the truck is even or close to even with the door to the building so i think i can share you sent some pictures jason oh, yeah. is this what you're referring to it is, and the the lighter area is the entirety of what I'm looking to change. Um, of course, we have to, you know, grade to it. But um, on the 
Brant, there's another picture that shows the blocks that build it up slightly from the main driveway. So there's uh, this. Yeah. yeah. She, they have to go in and then back into how was anyway. I live yeah. down the street, but I haven't really noticed. Um, well, that's good because you. That's a very yeah. difficult for drivers, depending on the size of the truck. Right, and I mean we don't use semis. I don't know how they would have got semis in here. Um, they have a sign at the end of the driveway that says trucks must back in, which is against your zoning policy anyway. So I'm trying to avoid that and be able to drive in just to the sort of left of where this picture is and then back up to the door as one normally would. So which of these doors are going to be, are they both going to be um, of the height for a truck, of a box truck? Yes. So you can see okay. I mean, so you're that taking out those concrete blocks, lowering this whole driveway pad. Exactly. Okay. Drainage. Yeah. So the, uh, currently there are two, um, pipes, one sort of in line with the, uh, sort of where those dumpsters are and where the, where the downspouts are in the picture and one that's more even with um, it's 20 feet further out from that. And those drain into a culvert on the property that is, um, I keep going to point at the picture, which doesn't work, yeah. uh, that it's just all the way to the left. There's a, there's a culvert pretty far down. It's like another five feet down over there. So we're gonna tie into that. We have a, with a, um, I guess they call it a trench drain I learned so that um, it drains properly. It's just that this is a very, here. very wet. It's along the tracks. This is all swamp. So just in this has been a challenging year. So it doesn't look like there's been any ex issues currently. Right. So, yeah, because, you know, I, I happened to be there a few times when there was a, a lot of rain and we had had a lot of rain. And, you know, uh, I, I keep having to tell my employees that there were 18 weekends in the summer and it rained 16 of them. So you know, we do this year. outdoor events. It was, it was, it was pretty rough. Um, and there, there are no, there have not been any issues. So, um, whatever they did when they built this building, um, you know, they, they did a really good job with, uh, water drainage and I don't want to mess that up because, uh, last thing I want is somebody slipping on ice in my dock area. This is, um, so you're not... go ahead, go ahead, Sarah, please. Okay. Um, is this going to be a regular dock, a loading dock size or lower? Are your um, box trucks lower than a conventional tractor trailer? I'm thinking of the Pioneer Valley Growers Association. Yes. Yeah, so, five um, or six feet. Uh, so a, a semi is um, 48 to 52, somewhere in there. And I think it depends on how loaded it is. Um, I'm going, I'm, my goal is 42. So okay. you know, more than half a foot less which is, you can't see it on this picture, but it's about the grade of the driveway. Um, basically, if you were standing where I took the picture from, that's as far, if not further down than, than we need to get. Okay, because I was gonna say, it's gonna be a bit. So both of these doors will then be loading doors, loading dock doors? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. So that one depicted, so this, so this one and this picture is, Really, so both of these will be loading down doors. Yeah, I mean, the one on the left would, would be the primary, just the way that a truck goes goes in. Um, uh, but the idea is that we can prep for stuff to go out on the one on the left, and we could unload stuff coming back on the the one on the right without getting in the way. You know, we're, we're working through that. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to flow, but we have two doors now, and it it's it's sufficient. So there's no increase in non-pervious area. What's non-pervious area? Pervious. You're replacing the, you're not affecting the amount of um, water that would percolate into the ground from from the rain. No, I don't, I don't believe so. Yeah, okay. Excuse me, everybody, but I've had two instances of frozen screen and it's telling me my connection is unstable. So mm. if I go away, that's what's happening. <laughs> we'll continue till then. Okay. Thank you, Mary. 
you sent the board at our request a letter describing saying we have no plans to change the exterior of the building or the parking area. And we've just been discussing the changing in the loading area. Uh, one thing I want to say is um, at some point in the next couple of years, the, the front part, which is the train station, is going to need new siding. And I would really hope that I, I, I went looking for um, historical photos of what it looked like as a train station, because I think it'd be really cool if I made it look like that again. Um, but I don't think that the budget of moving and digging out the dock and the rest of it's going to allow for that in the in the near future. There are plans for that. I don't know that there's a photo. I mean, you might check with the historical society. But yeah, I, I read that there's a historical society, and I think that'd be really cool. They have a website and and an information. Well, okay. Sarah. Sarah's on one of the officers, but it's info at whitelyhistorical.org. I'm just the treasurer. I'm not the historic yeah. guru. Yeah, but somebody will answer that and get back to you. So we've Many established that we've established that this parcel is in the commercial industrial district. And Jason, do you have a um, have you identified with the zoning enforcement officer what your uh, com what your use is from our table of use? Seems like there are two choices, and I'm curious which one you think it is. So interestingly, uh, <clears throat> Jim, yeah, he he told me it was an office use, and that I was used by right, but that didn't make sense to me. Um, there was another one in there and I don't, be, because he said I have uh, used by right, I haven't really given it much thought beyond that. Um, but I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of curious what you think it is. Because the two that look to me closest to it <clears throat> under commercial uses and the new, in our latest and greatest zoning bylaws, page nine, I see professional and business offices including but not limited to medical, legal, banking, et cetera. It seems, I'm not quite sure if that was the closest one. And then on the next page, seemingly there was a uh, one that seemed a little bit more applicable to what you're doing, business service and supply service establishments where they talk about mobile parts, office equipment, maintenance yeah. service, et cetera. So this seems much more it aligned with or consistent with a, a sound and events company than, um, you know, like medical or legal offices. Correct. Yeah. Um, I think that's the right one. The second one, the business service and supply service establishment, Judy? Yes. Okay. And again, both are allowed by right in the commercial industrial district. Hmm. Okay. Are you making any changes to lighting? Um, no uh, plans. Exterior. To no, exterior I mean, lighting. unless I unless I should, um, I haven't really given it much thought to be honest. But um, we're not there at night, so uh, I wasn't really it worried. Start about by it. five o'clock in winter, but it sounds like you're not that busy in winter. So. No, we yeah, that's when we rest. I'm curious, Sarah, since you're a resident of Christian Lane, um, do you, were there concerns about, say, how T Guys was operating in terms of traffic or noise? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out whether there's. He's literally across railroad tracks from Yankee Candles commercial but... entrance. What? It's like. 20 feet past them that's where the majority of the traffic is except for at 6 a.m 10 2 p.m and 10 p.m when yeah. shift change happens at yankee so this would not be and this is not retail so this would not be affecting nothing like yankee candle so mm -hmm. and there's no concerns the we had when two guys came for their special permit was parking and 
and truck access. And it sounds, especially with the retail shop there. So um, that's less of an issue here than it was with the T guys. And we approved that. Jason, just to follow up, you mentioned something about an apartment or rentals. Was that something you'd been hoping to do, which would be a different, you know, use in the same property? So yeah. So um, honestly, <laughs> honestly, I wasn't planning to rent out the apartment, um, at least not for the first year, as I'm I'm sort of getting getting what I need to together on on the property. However, I he then told me the owner told me that the current resident pays seven hundred and something dollars a month, which piqued my interest. But I, I was skeptical from the start that it was legal. Um, more important to me and, and and to the discussion is that they marketed it and as and included you know evaluation as if it were a legal apartment. So um, that that's that's the part that we're figuring out and discussing. Seems like that would be new, Sarah. Like, would you have, wouldn't people on Christian Lane like notice people living there? There is a house behind there. Yes. Here's the there so this is separate there. than that? Yeah. So uh, uh, that's, upstairs. yeah, that's, uh, that's on a butter. This is a, a woman who lives upstairs. It's a separate entrance, like right in the front. That goes upstairs and it's a, it's pretty small. It's actually really nice because it's got old beams from when I'm, you know when it was a train station. Yeah. I was not that aware. Was there back before the T guys were there? Was this there yeah. when some of the employees? Um, it was. Um, I read through the whole file on the property, uh, and uh, the T guys, uh, actually the wife of of the current owner, referenced it and referenced wanting people to rent it again. It seems like there was no decision and and and. From what I read, it it sounded like there were assumptions made that because it was being rented, it was okay for it to be rented, which is not an assumption I made. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it's there. The, the, it's zoning is, the zoning is not a problem. It's uh, residential is allowed by right in that district, I believe. A commercial industrial. <laughs> Well, yes, but Judy, it's, could it really be commercial, not industrial? No, it's yeah. not. I'm sorry, I'm not. It's not. It probably predates. I would imagine it's. It predates the establishment of commercial industrial, and it is, uh, pre-existing non-conforming. That doesn't address the safety issue about exits or smoke detectors or anything like that. That's a separate issue, but. I think that apartment goes way back. I bet it was there back when it was a general store. Probably. Yeah, because I remember that. Hmm. So I think it, uh, the zoning is probably not an issue. I I don't know about the, the kind of safety requirements that you have for a, a rental. So Judy, we would just treat that as a residential use co-located with uh, commercial industrial use? Yeah, well, I just checked commercial industrial. It's not allowed by right, but I think it would be pre-existing non-conforming. My insurance company doesn't want to insure it anyway, so <laughs> this may be moot. Okay. So given the facts before us, I. I don't see a strong argument for proceeding with a formal site plan review. And we we are within right as a planning board to agree to waive it. I'm curious, what are other people's thoughts about this? I was going to move that we waive it and will. Okay. So okay. Judy has moved that we waive the site plan review. Do I hear a second? Second. Tom the second. But I'm going to take Sarah's second since I think of Sarah's kind of representing the Christian Lane neighbor. community. Yeah, you know, like more of a stakeholder in this. So she gets the I second. I should rephrase it. I would waive the formal site plan review. I think we've done an informal one. Yes. 
Yes. Okay. So and and to, uh, because there are minimal changes to the site, and 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 be, okay. minimal changes to the site and uh, use. Okay, so we'll do a roll call vote. Sarah. Approved. I. Tom. Yes. Judy. Yes. Grant is I as well. Okay, so motion carries. Um, so Jason, I will notify the town clerk to uh, not deposit and or return the check to you. Um, and um, we wish you great success. And I would say, um, although we were, I actually bought the house that the T guys owners lived in before they got divorced. And my wife is a big fan of T guys and very sad that the products have are, you know, that the company is no longer viable. But we welcome Klondike Sound into Waitley uh, at that location and wish you great success. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. You are excused. <laughs> All right, we'll move to the next item on our agenda. I am going to propose that um, we move up in the agenda the um, updates from Sylvie, our community development coordinator. She was going to update us about um, research regarding solar canopy heights and the relationship to how that might impact our solar bylaw and also updates related to floodplain bylaw administration. So Sylvie. Can we stop sharing the. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks. Well, already keeping me on track. So. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so uh, firstly, I just wanted to um, talk about the solar canopies. Um, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I had reached out to um, the folks at um, UMass initially, um, but they didn't have the the dimensions that we were looking for on hand. But I did reach out to um, a few different uh, solar installers in the valley um, and heard back from one of them, um, and they gave me some good information. So I was happy. Um, that they were willing to discuss this um, and they wanted to commend the town on being proactive about this. Um, so I talked with a couple of uh, representatives from PV squared solar. Um, and so for solar canopies, um, they said that the common ground clearance for parking canopies is 14 feet at the low edge and 20 feet at the high edge and that a maximum height of 25 feet would accommodate most commercial parking canopies. So those are some dimensions that we can keep in mind. Um, and they offered, I had asked them, uh, you know, specifically about the dimensions, then just also if they had um, any sort of recommendations um, uh, for municipalities in terms of zoning, um, if they'd ever run into anything. Um, so they volunteered that, um, size restrictions should be based on square footage and not on system capacity because technologies change very quickly um, and using the area or height restrictions for small scale systems would allow the zoning to remain current even as technology evolves. Um, and I did look through um, the zoning uh, and saw that we did have some um, uh, some language um, to permit maximum height of 25 feet for things like off-street illumination um, uh, and uh, for um, for this I thought uh, since that was our maximum height it would make, probably make sense to remain consistent with that but of course that is um, not my decision but it seemed like 25 feet had some uh, uh, some precedent um, and uh, it would be it would make sure that we weren't um, restricting uh, the parking canopies that people may want to in the future um, use on individual properties. Um, so did anyone um, have any additional questions? Because I can follow up with uh, the folks at PV Squared to ask um, for more information, if that's uh, desirable. 
So I have a question, and maybe this is partly directed at Judy. So I'm looking in the solar bylaw. I thought this inquiry was driven by a planning board concern as to whether our existing solar bylaw was unnecessarily restricting, preventing solar parking canopies by limiting the height. And if I see that what I, I see that we have a height limitation of 25 feet in our bylaws. Um, if I'm, and I'm just as, I'm looking at the part G dimension size and height requirements, right? There are setbacks, there's a height of structures. This is in the new bylaws, uh, newest edition, page 89, height of structures, height of any structure associated with a large scale ground mounted solar electric installation shall not exceed 25 feet. And then if I understood that right, based on what Sylvie said, if 25, if typical solar canopy clearances are in the 14 to 20 foot range of height, and we're advised that 25 feet of clearance would be adequate, then I think I'm concluding, unless I misunderstood, that our bylaws are fine as they are. Did I misunderstand that, Judy? Is that your sense of the I, issue? I haven't gone back to check where. Um, I raised the issue because it was raised in the solar impacts, the draft solar impact study, okay. that the height limitation might might be a problem for canopies. And I'm not remembering at the moment whether this the structures, whether there's an additional height restriction for the panels above, above and beyond the structures. I know we tried to have the panels be high enough so that you could you could do dual use, which was not something people were worried about too much when we did this. I don't. Are the are the panels a structure or, or is there? You you read through. Yeah, I don't. I, I guess I would. I would want to check that before I agree with your sentence. Okay. There's I don't usually. Think. I mean, I have poles because I requested poles, but usually they're on like a frame that has two spots instead of the pole is the singular. But then there's the structure where the panels screw into and that goes higher and lower. So what, yeah, which is the structure versus which is the panels? Is the structure strictly the part that's on the ground? And then because theoretically those panels can be replaced if they break or as technology increases. And yeah, there's they stick above where they're screwed into the ground mounting. Yeah, well, we wanted to limit the overall height be, be for neighbors' concern concerns. But as I said, there is a section in the solar bylaw height of structures. It's in section subsection G. And all it says is it limits it to 25 feet. So, I mean, but, I guess you have to no, I, take I that, that the higher thing. What I'm wondering is if there's an overall height for the panels separate from the structure. Hmm. So perhaps what we'll do with this item is note in the minutes for board action between meetings to peruse carefully the solar, the bylaws to see if there's any reason why our existing bylaws might be more restrictive on a, on a solar canopy structure uh, and limiting its height below 25 feet. And Rather I guess, than us trying to do this live tonight. Yeah, I guess Sylvie, if, if the people who put together the solar impact study if, if 25 feet is the operative height limit in our bylaws and the people who put together the solar impact study thought that might be a constraint, maybe you should check mm -hmm. back with UMass and see if they're comfortable sure. with 25 feet because uh, yeah. they were the ones who, who raised the issue. 
Okay. From what you sound, it's a, it's, it sounds like we're okay, but um. All right, I will um I will uh, talk with them about that just to um, confirm that we're all on the same page. Great. Same panel. Okay, um, floodplain <laughs> bylaw. All right. So the uh yes, um the floodplain bylaws. Um so yes, we did attend a um a training. Um it was primarily uh to um gather people to talk about sort of like I, I think that um there's a lot of confusion about the responsibilities uh that um are placed upon the floodplain administrator and they wanted to make it clear that the um the floodplain administrator should also be working um, uh, with um, other people uh, on, you know, any the building inspector and people in the um, in CONCOM um, on these, you know, on these permitting questions that may arise. Um, so it's not solely the responsibility of the floodplain administrator, um, but sort of like a collective effort. Um, um, but yes, yeah, so floodplain. Uh, Sorry, I had my notes here. Um, so there'll, there'll be various people who may um, be called upon to assist with the permitting process. Um, and um, we will of course be referencing the FEMA flood maps and our local bylaws. Um, we uh, were made aware that we can get a sample floodplain development permit uh, from our contact person, Nadia, and um, that can be used to capture projects that fall outside of the jurisdiction of CONCOM or um, the building inspector officials. Um, and that they did mention best practices include making physical copies of the floodplain maps available to residents um, in the town clerk's office. Um, and also whatever um, projects do arise that we uh, log the addresses that are associated with the floodplain permits and also the work that was completed there and the entities involved. Um, and I think that um, for our community and for many communities, particularly rural communities, it, um, our local bylaws have to sort of capture, um, it can be a little difficult to know, like with agricultural purposes, for example, um, uh, I think Brian had given the example of, you know, if, if uh, what would, um, constitute filling in in the in the soil uh, you know are there are there agricultural practices that should perhaps be um permitted th uh, through the floodplain bylaw uh, process or um i think it's sort of um that's sort of the big question is like how do we want to capture those projects that are not necessarily a new building structure or something that concom needs to comment on but might still um, sort of fall under that canopy um, that we're, we're we're trying to um, uh, you know be in line with for the insurance purposes. So um, Brian did want um, to uh, circle back up with um, I believe Judy and Peggy who were working on this and sort of we can figure out um, where we want to go from here. But again, if there are any particular questions that I could try and answer or um, um, things that you want me to uh, pursue now um, uh, to assist with this process. Judy, remind me where we left the floodplain bylaw work we did in 2022? Is it, that was the last well, time we were dealt with it? Uh, I think the last thing we did was in the first set of minutes that Mary sent around tonight that we had when Peggy Sloan sat in on, on one session, and I don't remember whether it was with the planning board or the the floodplain bylaw working group, uh, she recommended that perhaps we could use our DLTA funding for to develop uh, a list of questions or well, a format, I think, for the floodplain administrator to, to deal with. And to the best of my knowledge, she that never happened. Um, and of course, now Peggy is only there intermittently. Um, I think perhaps Sylvie doesn't know that one of the real problems we've had is that because of the agricultural zoning exemption, 
and because Scott Jackson is so expert on on wetlands and the conservation procedure, we had structured our bylaws so that essentially the Conservation Commission, which deals with all the other wetland things and knows knows all the rules, he was very uncomfortable with the um, authority from the floodplain bylaw, and we have grappled with how to how to get him comfortable with this and hope that this administrative guideline was going to help do that. Brian can probably explain that to you better than I can, Sylvie. Um, but I think Scott is a very important piece in, in the next step. Okay. So maybe if maybe if if uh, Scott and Brian, and if we can get Peggy to sit in, I think she's doing some help or whoever is picking up her work. Okay. And I don't know if anybody else from the planning board wants to be involved or not. But we've had, the problem has been getting enough clarity to make Scott comfortable with, with Conservation Commission's role. I see. And, and unfortunately he knows he literally wrote the book on on wetlands and and he has spent years dealing with the agricultural exemption and wetlands rules and he knows a great deal about it more so much more so than than anybody at der does and mm -hmm. we've, we've gotten very little help from them on this they don't mm -hmm. they really don't understand the issue so so okay. it's getting him comfortable and and it's been hard to draft the bylaw because because the way it is, it goes through him. But we also have been unwilling to take it to town meeting because we didn't really feel we could give good educational session on what, well, given the example Brian had of mm -hmm. how it might affect farmers, especially. Most okay. of our most of our floodplain is an agricultural area. Mm -hmm. And that's the main issue. So Scott, so we, so we need more information so that Scott feels comfortable being an integral part of uh, supporting the floodplain administrator, Brian, um, in dealing with the requests that might come to us. I think that's, that's the way I would summarize it. I, right, okay. you might run that best, Brian, but I, I, that's what I would summarize it. We have essentially written it so that um, the Conservation Commission would more or less advise the floodplain administrator on All right. whether something needs the, the special permit or not. Okay, great. Yeah, I, um, I uh, that's helpful for me. I was sort of trying to piece together where everything was, and I wasn't quite understanding where the where the difficulty was, so that I could try and help with that. But yeah. yeah I, that's, that's... Um, I can. I'll try and dig out some some old emails. Um, the lady up in Montague was having the same problems, and and there are also some other issues. She pointed out that the the building inspectors systems don't necessarily provide the information that's needed, and needed some coding to do that. Okay. And I. I'll see if I can find those emails too, but um, okay. there's some practical things like, um, and I'm not sure now what they are. I haven't looked at this for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was hoping you'd have all the answers, but well, it doesn't sorry. work that <laughs> No, it's, it's our, our situation I think is unique and it's unique because Scott wants to tie up all the loose ends before they happen, which is very commendable. And I think everybody else is kind of going in and saying, well, we'll deal with it when it comes. <laughs> and um, so. so I want to ask the question, Sylvie, does the planning board had, for at least my recollection, like a 95% draft of this mm -hmm. floodplain bylaw, the new bylaw based on the new state template. And so first, Sylvie, do you have the latest, the, the, the draft that was the most recent when the planning board stopped pursuing this? I 
don't believe that I do. Oh, no. Okay. So, okay. Judy, I think you have I'll a copy you the draft. Of that. Okay. So yeah. you should get that to Sylvie. It seems to yep. me that at this point, and there was this whole transition of community development coordinators that also kind of mm -hmm. muddied the waters here. And so, one, one, I'm sorry. Well, I'll just finish the thought that it seems to me that the, the, what I'd like to see happen is we pass this draft bylaw over to Sylvie uh, because it identifies a floodplain administrator and, um, and let her work out the, the last little details because I think we could, once we know that who's going to do what and that can get put into the bylaw properly, then we can go through what we need to do to get it, um, you know, having another appropriate public hearing. Yeah, you're leaving out the step that somebody from the state has to tell us some information that we don't have. Yes. Yeah. I, I suggest I will send you the bylaw, Sylvia, and I'll try and set up a time when maybe you and Brian and I can talk. Okay. And and then we can widen it because mm -hmm. I may be I want to make sure Brian agrees with my evaluation of where things are. And All maybe right. I'll put in put in a call. Maybe we can talk to Peggy too. She has indicated she's available for occasional help as long as it doesn't involve evening meetings. She's <laughs> done with evening meetings. <laughs> Good for her. Uh, well, yeah, that all sounds good to me. Good. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Sylvie. All right, let's move on. We'll go back to our regular agenda about the Attorney General approval of the 2023 bylaw revisions and zoning map. Um, so all I wanted to do is sort of review what our action items are. And I think, Judy, I saw it. Did the email that you sent to Amy Schrader that was for Amy LaValle ever reach Amy LaValle, to your knowledge? Yeah, I, after you pointed out my error, I sent I sent it to Amy LaValle. I got no acknowledgement of it. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, they printed the book. They printed the book and they put the, the electronic copy up online and there are problems with, um, I mean, I, th I think it may be a matter of an opinion, um, but so for example, we did amend the solar bylaw uh, and it seems like the town clerk has adopted a new approach to annotating the, um, maybe it would be helpful if I share my screen, because I think if I try to explain this in words, um, it's just not going to make sense to people. Well, you get it up, maybe I can try. Yeah, go ahead. The, for, the previous bylaws, Lynn at some point started noting when amendments were made and she does it on the table of contents and in the section heading for each bylaw, like where it says solar bylaw. Amy put the change the um, the amendment notification in yeah. the text itself and not in the table of contents. So you can't look, I mean, you, you can look at the table of contents and see previous amendments, but not the latest ones because they're not there. So this is the electronic copy. Let me, uh, blah, blah, blah. How can I make this fit the full screen? Can you see this well enough if I if I make this page width? All right. So we have this kind of traceability information. You can see my mouse. We're looking at the solar electric generating facilities. So here in the table of contents, it's noted that there was this amendment in April of 2023. Okay, so she did add that. She did that, that was... but it's still, if I scroll down, can I scroll down to page, say, 54? Where are we now? Nope. So separately, just find page 54. 
it's still confusingly annotated in, in the text. And I just want to show you an example of Sam. I'm getting close. Well, first, did she add it to the headings? Uh, no, she did not add it to the headings that I can tell. Sorry, sorry to sorry to bother. Okay, me. no, it's just hold on. So you know what? It's gonna be easier if I just do solar. Take advantage of the fact that I can just search for it. Here we are. Here we are. Okay. So you'll see, folks, that up in the header, there's it, the last annotation of amendments says June 23rd, 2020. All right. Whereas we amended this bylaw in 2023. One of the places we did that was down in. Show you the example of how she changed. Oh, yes. So this is strange. This is the example and the utility connections. She left text in, in red font, and you can see that she included in square brackets at the point of the amendment that it was amended. So she seemingly in this particular example, and this is a unique case because she doesn't do this consistently and it's different, right? You'd have to search through the document to find these little amended annotations, but they're like they're buried in the text for the just the ones that we've done recently. In all other cases, when a, a major section of the bylaw is amended, the traceability of that, the dates are captured up at the top. Does that make sense to people? You see the difference? So she's she did this differently for this amendment, this where we fixed this part of the solar bylaw. The, um, and then remember, we also modified the aquifer protection overlay district bylaw. And that's similarly confusingly, uh, let me look for that. So I think the short answer here is that we need to follow up. So the table of contents is a little messed up. As you can see, the page numbers in the middle of the page instead of off to the right. So there's some, some editing changes that need to be made. And I don't believe this is anything that would require re-review by the attorney general, right, Judy? This is just editorial. No, nothing like this does. No. Page numbers, spelling mistakes or yeah. okay. not. All right. So one action, and I'm happy to, to, to follow up with this specifically with the town clerk, is ask the town clerk to make these changes. Pull out the these annotations from being embedded within the bylaw, which is now very inconsistent with other changes made in prior years, and just move that up to the top of the, of the bylaw section and fix these little editorial issues, all right? Um, so I'll ask her to make those changes and repost the electronic copy of the bylaws. Then um, the next thing, and this is a question for Judy, um, Judy, I seem to recall you have the access to be able to make some edits to the town website. Is that still correct? For the planning board and the 
CPC only. Okay. So I believe this page you were able to edit and put into place. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So you have an app, and I think this is linked to this page is linked to from the home page where you go to bylaws and regulations and then click on the Waitley zoning map. I can just take out that page and put the new map up. Okay. All right. So you're if gonna, I have a copy of if I have a copy of the new map. I will make sure you have a copy of the new map. So I'm going to send that to Judy. Judy will do the posting. I will, because I have the data that uh, the GIS specialist gave us for the assessor's online map. He prepared that for us too. So I will get that over to the assessor for posting on the electronic map. Um, and, oh, I guess, Judy, will you, now that I notice this, I go to the planning board page. Um, so I guess you'll make the necessary updates to the planning board page in terms of the content. And also, I guess you'll put in my name and contact information here, Judy. I'll do what I can. I don't, I had some trouble formatting. I'll do what I can and Jessica can help me if okay. I can. Okay, very good. Get it formatted. Just, right. just CC me on those communications and then I'll make a point of just following up on that. Okay, very good. Or the only other actually, thing maybe, go ahead. maybe Jessica should be doing this, but anyway, I'll, I'll try. Okay. Let's get rid of that first, that page first because that's confusing and then the rest of it's fairly straightforward. Okay. Very good. Awesome. I think that's all. There was a note in the attorney general when you, letter. When you, I'm sorry. When you contact Amy LaValle, um, she actually has control over this. And I think you, you'd have to make it a request. We would like it if, or it seems, okay. you know, because if she's decided this is the best way to do it, I see it. You mean the that's, changes to the that's, formatting? That's her. If she wants it to be in red because she feels that's easier. Yeah. I think that's her prerogative. It's true, though she only did that in the case of the solar bylaw revision. She did not do that in the changes. I think within she probably the just forgot, but just, just be aware that. Yeah. If All she, right. um, yes. Okay, so I we, will we ask. Find it, we find it hard to work with, but maybe just tell her that we're creatures of habit. <laughs> we have a tough time adjusting to this. I will send an appropriately diplomatic female request to the town clerk about making these changes. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, but I just want to clarify, you're not suggesting we ask the town clerk to make all of these other changes to the website as well. I think, well, I no. Think we no. should control our own web page to the extent that we can. Yep. Okay, sounds good. All right, so that's that. Um, next steps on the aquifer protection overlay district zones. Just let me update you all. I have reached out to Ryan Clary, the GIS guy at FERCOG, letting him know I passed on the map that you all discussed that we got from the water department. You know, it was not a high quality map, right? And I got the sense that it was maybe kind of haphazardly scanned off of some hard copy. Um, though it did show that it had the FERCOG logo on it, which sort of implies that somewhere in the bowels of FERCOG's data system, they probably have that map too. But anyway, I asked Ryan, I gave him the map. I said, hey, does this give you enough detail where you could redo our map with these new zones, right? Not, I, and he said, well, you know, the other one's been approved. I said, I know that, but what I'd like to do is get a new draft zoning map that we could potentially go through the process 
of a public hearing and so forth, but that depends on what we want to do tonight. My understanding from the minutes is that you all had this discussion at the last meeting and concluded that reverting to the overlay district boundaries depicted on the map we got from the water department was the right way forward. Is that still correct? Yes. Tom? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then we just need to get a new map and do a public hearing on it, right? Well, but yeah, but this is a zoning issue. We, I would think we would do it with all the other zoning issues before annual town meeting. Yes, yes, exactly right. Um, so you mean do a public hearing where this would be one, one public of the hearing. Yeah, right. And there with whatever else that we come up with as we lead up to town meeting. Good. Okay. Anything else that we needed to talk about? I'm just make checking that I know where we are and what our next steps are. Okay. Very good. Um, so maybe I'd like to get this off our do this easy thing first before we get into the housing production plan discussion. So um, recognizing and thanking Peggy Sloan. Judy, would you like to say a little bit about that and how you propose we do this? Well, I wanted, we, I floated a, an informal suggestion by email and I thought it would make more sense if we formally voted to do it. We can either do it by a letter or I was thinking maybe we could come up with a certificate of appreciation, perhaps framed, maybe not, um, just for uh, however many years of very helpful service support. Because she really has been extraordinary, um, certainly. I don't know on your first term on the board, Tom, but um, I don't know when she came. We can she, find she that was out. there from the, from my beginning, at least. She's yeah. been there a long time. Yeah, and um, always helpful, and and you know, I'm I'm feeling very lost without her. Actually, to tell you the truth, but so I I suggest a certificate of appreciation and a letter um, thanking her for all she did. Would you like to make that as a formal motion? So move. I'll second that. All um, roll call, Sarah? Yes. Yes, Tom? Yes. Judy? Yes. And Brant is yes. So the motion passes. Um, I like the idea of the framed uh, certificate of appreciation. Um, we've actually, my Janine and I have had some experience doing that like we, with the Appalachian Mountain Club, we work with Sunrays Printing and Hadley. We know where to get the framing done. So maybe if you, Judy, who's had the longest, at least, at least, at least in comparison to me, relationship with um, with Peggy, well, that's really tough. Propose no, a little bit of I... language, um, and then we can, Janine and I. You know, we'll work on drafting up what the certificate would look like. And, you know, usually ends up having, you know, some kind of, anyway, it looks like a certificate. We'll probably get the Waitley Planning Board logo on. I'm pointing to this thing on my wall. I don't know if you could see it. Because yeah. it was, no, I think we've all, we've all seen yeah. them. Right. Okay. So you'll do the little bit of the wording and then we'll, we can all physically sign it at some point and then get it framed. What is the price point just because of mass? law on public employees that's a really good question it's, it's on the order of like a hundred dollars i think 50 is where it is now the whole gift thing well she's retired you can buy right? you can if you can buy an eight is and a half by 11 a frame for right bucks. and that's my other part how does this fall and are we allowed to do that within our town budget also we have Sorry. a pretty big budget. Yeah, we've. But I mean, from... what are the rules on what we're allowed to spend? Yeah. Okay. All right. I so know. let me follow up on that question. So 
I would be happy to donate the frame. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we can make this happen. And there's still this, I think Sarah does bring up a valid point. So what is her Peggy status? I mean, if she's retired, then giving her a gift of any amount no longer is relevant, right? I just know what UMass's rules for retirement are in gifting. Ah, okay. And so in UMass does fall under the state criteria, but I'm not sure if they're more strict than state criteria. Mm -hmm. okay. And I mean, even as she's receiving a public pension also. So I mean, it because she would be county government. So, so do you think the limit is $50? I'm not sure anymore. Yeah. I just know sometimes thanks, just say thank you as an active current employee and giving human subjects is this actually considered a gift though right and that's my other thing and that's maybe where we need to ask town accountant town strictures whether they consider this is an acceptable item we can do with our budget i can tell is you right, i got something like that from the west historical is, commission when is I, recognizing, I, I wasn't a paid employee you recognizing well, someone for their with their contributions the same as is that is this synonymous with a gifting them by recognizing it seems seems a little tortured we're probably okay but i think sarah brings up a valid point and let's just run this to ground yeah, yeah I so I, i'm happy to do that and i'll start with brian um i mean i've remembered seeing all of those training videos and conflict of interest and stuff like that so I can just check on that, but I'm sure we can figure out a way of doing it. Um, the conflict of interest thing usually is $50. That's, I did, had to do that training fairly recently. So yeah, um, yeah. for what it's worth. <laughs> All right, so. Right, and sure Tom's, I, Tom's point is valid here too. This isn't really a monetary or financial gift in any way. Yeah. She's not particularly going out and being able to spend this. In... <laughs> and she's it's not, not going to be. Swift ticket. <laughs> she's yeah. also not going to be in the position where she could be influenced by the gift, supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably okay. And on a, even though this is maybe more in the category of additional items not anticipated, on a related note, if we're good with where we are with Peggy, I think we are, then I, I'd like to say that it seems to me, at least I personally would like, and this is clearly not a, should not be any kind of issue, is um, at least a letter or a similar certificate of appreciation for Don, the former chair, right? Don't you think, Don? I mean, I, I found Don super helpful. I know serving on these boards is, you know, a lot of work <laughs> and often no, you know, you just get personal satisfaction if if that. Um, so is there any reason, I mean, would people support either a letter or a similar certificate of appreciation for well, service to the planning board? Now, obviously yes. this is not a, not any kind of concern. He can't be influenced or. We've never done it, but it's not a bad tradition to start. I, I think um, I would be delighted to start that. And what I, and sort of on that note then I would, whether it's a letter or a certificate of appreciation, if you or really anyone who watches this video later um, would send me an anecdote or something or some information about like, I don't know much of the Don's history on the board before I joined. Like, when did he join? If if you could just share a little bit of information with me or some noteworthy accomplishments over his tenure on the planning board, that could be helpful. I mean, certainly if we're writing a letter um, or even just for but I, I like the idea of a framed certificate of appreciation, similar to what we're doing for Peggy. Um, I guess we should 
Maybe we should vote on that. I'll do that as a motion. I move that we recognize our uh, former planning board chair, Don Sluter, with a certificate of appreciation framed, um, or if that's for some reason not possible, a uh, formal letter of appreciation from the board. That's my motion. Second, Sarah seconds. Um, votes, Tom? Aye. Judy? Aye. Sarah? And Brant is aye. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, I think we're now ready to do the penultimate item on our agenda is the zoning revision priorities um, informed by the approved housing production plan. And I'll say as our representative to the housing committee, I still don't have much more to say. Um, Catherine and I have been going sort of laggily back and forth over what to do. We've, I think both for different reasons, come to a somewhat jaded view of whether revisions to expand accessory dwelling unit opportunities within Waitley just doesn't seem any more to us like it would move the needle much. Um, and then I had separately reached out directly to Jim Hawkins. I got private email from Jim saying what basically he said in that article um, that we saw about Ashfield's interest that he said there's just not much interest. He said he doesn't have a good way of quantifying or pulling data that it would give me hard data on how many accessory dwelling units exist or have been built in Waitley. So we, we lack data on that. But he said, and this I would characterize as his opinion, perhaps, you know, expert opinion, that uh, there's not a lot of motivation to, to build these accessory dwelling units because A, just the general cost of construction and B, issues related to septic. So his feedback seemed to be like, well, the planning board is going to spend time and energy on zoning bylaw revisions. This might not be the best use of our time. But will yeah, it get Sarah. us farther ahead with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? And not that we want to prevent 40B, but give us that protection to be able to choose. Will that, will having this expand, expand at least that with the Commonwealth? Well, that's Judy, because because there's no requirement that the accessory apartments be um, certified or or be permanently affordable. Okay. In fact, they're unlikely to be. Very much so. And, and, and that's that, all that that's all that counts for forty B is okay. if the state looks at this permanent affordability restriction. And really to Sarah's question, I think um, I think the reality is that what counts for that 40B protection is not, oh, you know, we tried, we did this, we did that. And there's been, I think it's actually based on want to, you know, measurable increases in the subsidized housing inventory in Waitley. And I think there's a general feeling that in a short of an act of God, it's gonna be very hard to hit those targets that are not, they're not big, <laughs> but for Waitley, they're, they seem kind of large historically. Um, one query that came back to me from Kate was like, and this really relates to some of the comments you made, Judy, that maybe we should be looking at, like the issue in Asheville was changing um, or allowing more structures or allowing flag lots or you know basically 
reducing the minimum size of lots, which can be a sensitive subject for people. But you had some ideas, Judy, that got into the housing production plan for um, creating certain kinds of density bonuses or dimensional requirement waivers under certain conditions. And maybe yeah, those course. are the things we should prioritize. The two items that were on that list that I would prioritize are one to look at the density bonuses in the cluster cluster housing bylaw and see if they need to be increased. Because it's that bylaw has been there for some time. It's the reason we created AR2. We expanded the zoning around it to three acre zoning and the thought that clusters would become much more attractive. And there yeah. hasn't been a single application. And I don't know, it's at least 10 years. I'd have to go back and look when we did that. So it's probably in the table of contents of the plan. Okay. So that I would start with that one. And um, the other one I would look at is the one that I suggested based on the on the historic building reuse bylaw where where you relax or waive the dimensional requirements if if there is a an affordability restriction placed on on at least one of the on a unit or all the units. Mm -hmm. And I think that solves a few problems. And I would do this by special permit. But if you make all the lots smaller, yeah, they're cheaper, but there's no guarantee they'll they'll be accessible and you'll have more competition for those little lots, mm -hmm. littler lots. And you're increasing density without necessarily getting getting the goal you're after. Um, so I like the idea of tying it to, to on a affordable affordability restriction. And, you know, I think it'll, it would allow some, some buildings to be built on lots that are now not buildable. Hmm. It would also allow things like, uh, I've forgotten the term, maybe Sylvie knows, um, where two units are, are literally adjoined. They're separate units, but they have a common wall, which makes them more multi family efficient. House. It's like a duplex, but it's but it's two it's condominium, I guess, really, but it's not a single unit, but some some innovative things like that would be more possible. And, and I think it allows for some creativity. We certainly, I don't, you would do this waiving when there's a public good. And I think the affordable housing is a, is a demonstrable public good. So it makes sense to me. It would require, I think one thing that was in the production plan was that the, the housing committee would be educating the people on what affordability really means. Mm -hmm. And that it's not, you know, it's all the town employees and, you know, everybody's kids and that kind of thing. Because I think there's a perception that, that it's a whole different kind of people that we don't want them here. Oh. Yeah. We do want them here. <laughs> These are the people who make our lives work. So those are the two I would concentrate on. Sarah, Tom, any anything you'd like to add? No, I, I think I, I agree um, with Judy's comments. And um, I, I, I think it'd be worthwhile taking another look at the cluster zoning. It's the one, one tool we have that might be able to be modified to, to actually result provide some results. Mm -hmm. So I can def I will definitely make it a point to look at that 
particular bylaw in detail. And, and at our next meeting, we can um, have a little discussion about what it was intended to do. And um, it would really be good to get some kind of insight into why it hasn't been used. Do you have any intuitions about that, Judy? Well, I think developments are inherently more difficult when there are septic systems involved. They're more expensive. Mm -hmm. I think And, you know, Pine Plains, John Robleski was smart enough to realize that this wasn't the best agriculture land in town. And it was a big parcel. And, but he had to work like a dog to put the lots together to get a big enough piece. But there are a lot of 20 acre parcels in town. It's not like. Mm -hmm. But so, it's the location, it's whether they're ag whether they have a conservation restriction or an ag yeah. restriction on them, it's, yeah. yeah. And part of it was the financial crisis. I mean, one one real reason for all of this, this um, housing shortage is just that after the financial crisis, nobody built anything for seven or eight years. It was just too difficult. Well, I think we're headed for the same kind of thing with the interest rates the way they are in construction loans. I, I think it's going to yep, be a while I think so. people are looking at these kind of projects. But I think, you know, I wouldn't be too hard to do a survey of other cluster <clears throat> zoning and see whether ours is way out of line or not. And that's something I think the housing committee could do. Trying to get it off our our task list. Yeah, you yeah. noticed. Yeah, there was the a FERCOG lot. Of... Could probably FERCOG got to be able to help there. Okay, so why don't we close on that subject, uh, and then we'll do some administ administrative administrative uh, administrative work. I think we can do some approval of minutes. So I did a I did a little review of where we stand for 2023. Um, our January and February minutes are posted. Uh, my understanding is that um, at the last meeting, so I have notes that July 12th that Judy did, those were approved but I don't know that they've been, they certainly haven't been posted. Judy, did you, so? No, I that, thought, I didn't send them to anybody. Um, and they're in final form now in our OneDrive, as I believe. I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. I All thought right. writing the minutes was enough. Okay, all right, all right. Well, we should get everything that we've approved posted. So I will. Um, we I'll also approve it. Mary's subject to. to so the, this was March 29th. I had a note that that was approved. That was Mary's. Yep. Okay. Subject to making the changes that were noticed, noted in right. my amendments. Right. But since Mary was the author of that, I think it's. It's really for her to make sure the final draft is clean and ready for posting. Do you agree, Mary? I agree, but I'm still having trouble using OneDrive until I get another computer. I don't think that's going to change. Could somebody just email me? I didn't put it. I didn't put it on OneDrive, Mary. Okay. I emailed it to you. You, you did mail it to me. Okay. Before um, the meeting. Before the last meeting. Before. Yeah, so we're talking about April 29th. And um, it was before our September meeting. Like okay, March, 20, March 29th, ready to go after amendments. But it needed things like the like the files. 
Yes, I think I remember that. Uh, anything that was documents and, and reviewed. Advice, and one of the suggestions was to take out the full text of the DMCTC um, amendment since it was oh, cited okay. as a, that I was mean, there were anyway, so like that was <laughs> it. I don't know. I just thought it might. I guess it it doesn't matter so much since that didn't wind up going anywhere anyhow. <laughs> but yeah, well, um, I thought it might be important we at the it time. Would shorten. You, you can go look at the the document. It on would file, definitely but, shorten it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I know it was stuff like that, but it, it was, and there were some amendments too. But but you should so have you, it. You, in your you email. Mean, you emailed that to me before the September meeting. That's yes. that's what you're saying. Okay, I will look for that. All right. So Judy's. So between Judy and Mary, we'll make sure that Mary has the the board edited minutes from March 29th. If you don't have it, let me know. I'll send it to you again. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to send over to the town clerk the meet the, the approved minutes for July 12th. And then tonight we can look at March 22nd. And I'll share my screen. Both Judy and I reviewed that, made some edits, which I'm sharing now. So Judy suggested. So John H. That was that that wasn't John. I was I thinking. Know. I, maybe John Hanmer because Chris Chamberlain and was yeah. talking about that, but he I didn't find any reference to him within the minutes as having had anything to say. So and the meeting was recorded, so we don't do we know which, whether he was there? Which one are you looking at? Uh, this is March 22nd. Oh, okay. I also have a question. The the only thing we see on the on the recording is John H. Actually, I don't know if you can even see John H. because okay. you you see everybody's block with something in it. That way, he, maybe it showed up. I but thought one thing, one thing you don't I see on the recording is anything that's shared on screen, and. If I, you know, I, I don't, I didn't have any information about, as I said, him speaking up to say anything. I don't know. I'd be happy <laughs> to just drop the, if he was not, if he was not a speaker and really didn't get identified. I think going forward when we have guests, at least I'll make a point when I'm moderating these meetings to get everyone to identify themselves for the record. <laughs> They don't have to grant. Oh, they, they don't. don't. I think you just make sure the people who speak. Okay. We had that come line. up on another committee. Okay. Is Rachel's last name really nurse? I thought she was an attorney or something with Tim. Tim's daughter name is Sarah. He doesn't, his ex. Oh, this. I. Uh, well, I'll double check that. I'll I'll check the application. I seem and to be. I think she's an assistant on the on the farm, but I don't okay know her name. I think she's an employee, but that sounds familiar to me. Um. See if I can. One second here to look at the. Um, for what? Oh, great. So Rachel, uh, we're talking about Rachel. Is that right? That's her name listed in the minutes. Her, yeah. her yes. last name is actually Monette. M-O-N-E-T-T-E. 
Okay. Rachel Monette. Okay, I'll get that changed. Okay, great. Sometimes searching your email inbox actually yields something worthwhile. Okay. Um, so there were these various changes made. Let me just switch the review so people can see all the markup. Maybe it would simpler to ask if people have read them and have any problems. Sarah, Tom? I'm good with okay. the changes. Yeah. You and Judy. Very good. Okay. Then I'm going to close this. I'm going to stop sharing that. So um, somebody uh, will move to approve the minutes of that meeting. I move to approve the minutes from the March 22nd meeting with Judy Marklin and Brant Chaikis updates. Okay. Second. Second. All right. Made and seconded. Uh, roll call Sarah, presumably. Yep. Tom? Yes. Judy? Yep. And Brant is yes. Okay. So 322 as revised is approved. Um, so then there was nine, well, let's do an easy one. Nine, September 27th, Judy did those minutes. Um, and I reviewed them. Those were from the last meeting. Um, some minor edits. I was not there, so I, but I really appreciated the minutes. So do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? I spelled my city wrong someplace, as I remember. What was that? I, I think there was a correction to McPhee somewhere. Yes, yeah. There was a, a little edit that I made there. Um, and if we approve those, then I will clean it up and send it for posting. Okay. I, uh, I make a motion to approve the nine Judy's September 27th minutes as amended. And to the second. Somebody want to second that? Second it. Okay. Judy was had a conflict of interest. All right. Um, made and seconded roll call. Judy. Yes. Tom. Yes. Sarah. Yes. And Brant is yes. Okay. So 927 is approved. Brant to send. Clean and send. All right. And then the last one that was circulated. Late, late today was April 26th, April 26th. I have a small change to it too. Somewhere in it, it says a butter Richard Korpieski. He does not abut the Monaghan. Uh, okay. So mm -hmm. he's, he's just, he's an attendee yes. or a, a Waitley citizen. He is a Waitley citizen. There isn't a butter named Richard, but I think it's, oh, my, no, I don't think Rick is a direct butter, actually, but but not R Richard Corpius. No, I, I read that very quickly. Glad somebody else read it more carefully. I'll note for Mary's benefit that both, that independently, Judy and I sent edits that we sent around earlier today. Okay. Typically, when we're a little bit better sequence, one of us goes first and then the other adds to it. So now there are two non-merged sets of changes that you have to look at. Okay. I just want to clarify something for me. Uh, the, the Richard Korpievsky is not an abutter. Is the abutter also named Rick, Richard Rick? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, no, no. he's okay. not a direct abutter. 
thinking of where Rick Adair Okay. The, okay. The other guy you were thinking of. Citizen Waitley. Not, uh, yes. Okay. I got that part. I, I just yeah. didn't know if oh, we, we don't need to put a Richard and a Rick. In, with, yeah. There was no the other last Adair. name. Because okay. I think what was on the block actually said Rick or Rich. I I don't know. Yes, he's Rich Korpieski attended that meeting. Yeah, I know he was there because his name pops up in the minutes. Yeah. But then there was a block that just said Rick. <laughs> and I wondered if we had Rick or Rich. I can't remember. I, I just wanted to make sure we weren't talking about two people with a similar name who were different people. And yeah. Anyway, okay. he's not in a butter. I'll call him an attendee or a wait, citizen. Okay. Attendee is fine. Okay. So I or think just, given just the very say Rich Korpieski, that's all you need to do. So do I hear a motion to approve the minutes of April 26th as amended by myself and Judy? And with uh, Sarah's live edit tonight. So moved. Do I second. hear a second? Second. Judy has seconded it. All right, roll call. Sarah. Sarah. Yes. Tom. Yes. Judy. Yes. And Brant is yes. Okay. So, so that's approved. That's over to Mary for final edits and cleanups and getting to posting. Okay. So let me just recap where I think we are. Um, March 22nd approved and in Mary's court to clean up and get posted. April 20, uh, April 29th is approved and that's also in mary's court for cleanup and posting april 26th approved mary's court cleanup and posting july 12th approved in brand's court to clean up and get posted and september 27th approved in brand's court to clean up and post and that would be wonderful. And then there's four left, ideally for our next meeting, that are missing. These are the May 3rd, May 17, May 31. May was such a great month for us. And June 14. And then we'll be up to date. And, oh, so here's my question. And this sort of a question to you, Judy, I may have misremembered. Is there a way we can just sort of post some kind of like, provisional minutes so we're good with open meeting law you know does could it be like draft with minimal information or not i can't answer that but i would be reluctant to do so because the devil is in the details mm -hmm. and if there's any so we don't want to have something that's misunderstood or incorrect or um all right it's, it's, just... the nuances really matter this is this is legal stuff okay okay all right well we're um you know may is quite a while ago so um really leaning on mary to <laughs> get these out so that we can approve them all and be be good with the law by our next meeting. Speaking of which, I have a I have an additional item. Yep. Uh, all right. I just want to before we do that, I just want to confirm that our next right we will have our next regularly scheduled meeting on Wednesday, October. I'm sorry, Wednesday. November 29th, the week after Thanksgiving. Okay, so that's our target to get these last four sets of minutes um, out and ready to be approved at that meeting. Okay. Good. Okay, awesome. Uh, Judy, so we're now into the additional items not anticipated. And I didn't see this one coming. 
Well, I I drive down Christian Lane to five and ten quite a bit, and lately there have been little signs for Simmer's Creamery or Smorowski's Potato Festival, and Smorowski's own that parcel of land and. But one of the signs for Summer's Creamery, which used to be Pachesnik's the other day said, uh, breakfast sandwiches now available. And I also learned that DMCTC is a partner in ownership of that facility, which very surprised me. Where is it? The 5J Creamery, Creamy on River Road is now Simmers Creamery. Oh, oh right, right. DMCTC is a business partner of Simmers? Yep. Oh, I wonder if they have cannabis ice cream. Not yet. Well, I don't know how, how that, <laughs> that's a good point, but um, because the point I was going to make is that that facility can only do retail as long as 25% of, of the um, value of what they sell, either by volume or value. 25% either by volume or value has to come from the farm. Um, unless they are selling cannabis, which I don't think would be no. legal. Legal. No. Um, I was a little taken aback to see breakfast sandwiches and also that they're still open for ice cream. Um, you know they do other food, right? Yeah. It's similar to what they do in Sunderland. Okay. So what I wondered is whether it would be appropriate to send I, I don't shop there, so I'm not, I and I certainly haven't been there since they bought, since they opened it. Um, I thought maybe it would be a good idea to send them a, a polite letter reminding them that, that they're a farm stand, they're allowed to sell retail as a farm stand and, and pointing out the 25% limitation. But just reminding them of that. I think that would be good because I suspect the rules he operates under in Sunderland are different than Waitley's. All right. Um, that sounds reasonable. Is that something that the board should vote on? One more question with that, because I know many of his operations are in either Hatfield or Sunderland. As long as the farm in general grows them or grown yeah, in, I think, the, I think the wording is under the control of the owner or something like that. Okay, they, they can they can rent them too. Yep, but it has to come from there. It has to be their produce one way or another. And I don't think Pachesnik ever did that, but I know that he repeat he had told the building inspector he did, so there wasn't much we could do about it. Um, so I'm, I will say I'm, since I'm not familiar with this aspect of the bylaws, I'm, I'm uncomfortable voting to do that tonight. I'm comfortable committing to doing this research and working, say, with Judy to draft up a letter that we discuss at our next meeting. Then I would at least feel more informed. Sure. But it sounds reasonable. Send Sorry. you to um, section Mass General Laws 40A, section 3. 40A, section 2? 3. Section 3. Okay. I pledge to look into that. So so we won't have a vote on this. The idea will will it'll come back up on our agenda at our next meeting. Um, I have heard because we have we've I can't say we shop there regularly. I know Janine 
visits a lot of farm stands in the area and has learned that they uh, have decided as a, as a business strategy to try this year to, unlike J and, uh, 5J, 5J was seasonal, right? They would close around probably yeah. by now, kind of like Frosty over in Sunderland. But Simmers has decided to try to stay open year round. So that's all I know. And it's indirect via my wife. Um, and, I, and I believe that means selling whatever they're going to sell all year long. Um, so they wouldn't be operating like say Galanco, which shuts down, but perhaps more like Atlas that I believe remains open year round. Okay. All right. Um, any other items not anticipated? Any updates on um, new board member? Uh, no, I have pledged by email that uh, as I think so. Uh, JD Ross of Egypt Road has indicated interest in a joint. We have a vacancy. Uh, Don's va Don's position is vacant. And uh, Tom is doing us all a favor of not creating another vacancy. Uh, but I'm sure Tom would like an opportunity to pursue his other adventures. So we so have one letter of appreciation. Yes, that's right. Well, hey, they are going to become collector's items. Kid you not. Um, I look forward to it. So um, I had an email from JD. I simply said, well, you know, why he wrote to me of all people, you know, just a member of the board, maybe he, anyway, whatever. I said, we were going to elect a new chair. And once we knew what was happening, somebody from the planning board would reach out to him. So I will now do that in the capacity as planning board chair and set up a conversation well, it's, with it's him. Not, it's Nat who appoints. Yes, Nat appoints. That's right. But Nat has sent an email indicating that he's not going to foist or force anybody on the planning board and would welcome our input. So it seems reasonable for me to at least have a conversation with JD and find out a little bit more about his interest and like, you know, familiarity with the zoning bylaws and willingness to, you know, do take some of the Anyway, I'd just like to find out a little bit more about his interest. And um, I think we have a we have a, a highly functioning planning board at this point. It would be good to try to avoid breaking that if possible. Uh, My input would be it would be fabulous to have someone with some engineering or building background. And I'm I have voiced to myself and my family going, wow, he would be great, but he can't have enough time. So he would be, we currently don't have anybody with engineering or building per se experience. So this would be a really great insight and representation. I was thinking the same. I think there is a concern that, you know, that as we are all here to be objective and not have a particular agenda you know we're, we're we don't run for these positions so it's not like we're elected to pursue a particular platform so it just would be worth making sure that somebody who brings that kind of valuable experience to the board is not necessarily coming in with um you know a particular agenda to transform our zoning bylaws in a way that you know we might be uncomfortable with, but it's, it's I think it's good. Other representation that. and full representation of all townspeople is important. And I, my personal view is we don't currently have that on some that's of our true. current boards in town that's, right now. That's true. That's true. Um, and then what else? Well, Chris I, Kellogg. Uh, Chris yeah. Kellogg. Yes. Great too. Tom and I independently recommended him to Matt and Nat sent him a, a very formal letter without talking to him. <laughs> and I sent him an email 
following up on that, thinking that. Uh, I would coordinate with Nat on before, uh, Brent, before you get too far along, uh, make sure we're not crossing lines with what um, Nat's trying to do, because I think he's talked, he's trying to talk with uh, Chris Kellogg okay. um, for a one year appointment, and that may be mean that it, it's taken off the table. Well, there are two, there are two openings effectively, because because yeah. you'd like to you'd like to leave as soon as there's somebody else. Yeah. So we should be pursuing more than one option. Yeah. I I don't. My guess is Chris is not interested. He hasn't. He didn't respond to my email. He didn't respond to Tom's phone call. Didn't respond to. Is I haven't phone call. seen Chris around town in a long time. Is he? I mean, I find it odd that he's not returning phone calls. I don't that's know. That's neither here nor there, but I mean, yeah, he, he's a professional and that's a professional courtesy. I, don't, I yeah. don't think ghosting doesn't seem in character with him. No. Nicholas did not think he'd be interested, but he thought we should try. Okay. It always helps when, when you know somebody to ask them. So I'm glad to hear that people who know Chris have reached out to him independent of Nat. I mean, I know, you know, I got this out of the blue. Initially, I got this out of the blue letter from Nat, you know, but I had separate. He did that? He just sent a letter? I, I find that really difficult. <laughs> um, but then I Paul, followed Paul up. Paul you know, the call and say, you know, think about this. <laughs> Or find you at the transfer station and say yeah. what you think. I think in that case, yeah. I had a suspicion that it was Nicholas who I knew. At. So I followed up myself with Nicholas. But I think, yeah, recruiting like people you know should be a more of a, like the letter from the town moderator should come after. After, yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm not sure that the Matan moderator shouldn't be the first contact, but I don't think it should be via a formal letter, but that's my opinion. Um, like if Amy LaValle wants to insert the amendments in the text, it's her prerogative. I, I wondered if Lynn Sibley might be a good candidate. Um, she certainly knows the bylaws well. She's wow. good with people. Um, I don't know if she'd be willing. She's had some time off. It's not like we have that many evening meetings. But I think she'd be very good. It's true, too. Though I still see her at town offices all the time. I was just there the other day, and there's Lynn. <laughs> well, she can work so many hours a week for a while, yeah. and she's helping train. Yeah. yeah. But she's not going to night meetings, and she's not. So next time I see Lynn, or if any of us see Lynn at town offices, I think that would be a great question to ask. If people agree. Oh, yeah. Like, to me, that's a no-brainer. And because she's... And the, so, so she's sort of a town employee, but not, right? I don't think there's a prohibition on a town employee being a member of the committee either, but that's probably not the best idea, but she's she's really you not. Men. men would know. Yeah, she would know. Yeah. And if uh, she's not in, you know, if she wants to wait, she could replace me when my term is up. Yeah. Well, once we tell her that there's the potential down the road of a big certificate of appreciation. <laughs> I think it's like, it's a no brainer, easy decision. Almost, almost as good as being in the front of the annual report. All right, I think we've had enough fun for one night. What do you guys think? Does motion someone want to make a motion? Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. You know, I, this is the one part of Robert's rules I've never been clear on. Do we really have to vote on a motion to adjourn? No. no. Once it's seconded, we're adjourned. Okay. Then we will reconvene as planned at the end of November.